Welcome and thanks for coming. Keeping with our outstanding seminar series, we have Dr. Sean Anderson here, hailing from Ventura, CSU Channel Islands. He did his undergrad at UCSB. He did his PhD at UCLA. He did a postdoc at Stanford. And then he began at CSU Channel Islands in 2005, right? Uh, yeah. And, and something, especially for faculty, because we might have questions on this, is it had only existed for, what, two years or something? Yeah, so if you look on the logo, it says 2002, which is a little baloney, because we didn't actually take our first freshman until 2004. Yeah, so he was right there at the onset, which is really interesting to just hear about how you create a university. Are <laughs> creating. I think it's are creating. We're still uh, inventing yeah. as we go, but yeah. Anyway, he's an outstanding marine ecologist and, uh, and kind of broad-reaching research, a ton of kind of innovative technological stuff. So I think you're going to see some drone footage and other things, which are really cool. Also, Sean's work engages students a lot in his research, so I bet you're going to see a lot of that. And as the jacket implies, he's a very entertaining man. And uh, I won't take credit for the expletives, but they might <laughs> Yeah, there might be some F-bombs. I'll, I'll attempt to be an adult in this presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and um, how dark should we make this? As dark as you, if, if people want to go to sleep, that's cool. Whatever, whatever works for you guys. A little bit darker, yeah, at least that. That's good. Probably good. Okay. All right, All right, cool. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks, Ro. All right, so uh, very kind words. I'm not excellent researcher or nothing like that, but, um, but I try. I try hard. Um, so thanks for the invitation, you guys. Um, I'm not going to talk about once through cooling or... Thomas Fire, a lot of stuff we typically work on. Today is going to be, I thought it's Friday afternoon, right? You guys, you need more data? Um, I'll show you a little teeny bit of data, but mostly I just want to talk about um, sort of a broad overview. We don't, as professors, we don't, I don't at least, seem to have a lot of opportunity to step back and think about the things that are uh, impacting us as a, as a discipline, as a, as a broad group of folks. And so I was, that's what I want to do today, is to try to give you guys some ideas of things that if you're not using some of this technology, I would encourage you guys to think about it, it has a tremendous application for virtually everything that, um, that we're doing. And, um, and so I have all these, these funky words up here like uh, uh, immersive learning, which is a new word that we're using, which combines augmented reality, virtual reality, all 360 video, all that sort of an umbrella term. Um, and then what I refer to as conservation mechatronics. So using drones, using ROVs, all the, this, this cool new robotic technology, but in, an, in a conservation and monitoring uh, context. So, so here we go. Uh, and you guys can, by all means, interrupt me if I don't make sense or whatever. I, I'm, I'm getting over this cold and I had this massive headache today. So I, I'll attempt to be coherent. But, but uh, before we get going, since we're going to talk about technology, some people think I'm a technology guy. I'm not a technology guy. Um, I want to um, pay homage to some of my forebears. So some of my friends that are in the audience that have, that have shaped me tremendously. Don Kineshra first hired me, gave my first job in science. But the first science thing I did, the, very, the first official science thing was with this guy. His name is Mel Manalis. He's retiring tomorrow. I was, gonna, I was originally planning on staying up here for the weekend and seeing a bunch of friends, but I actually have to go back down to his retirement party. He's retiring after 45 years of teaching at UCSB. And he's a physicist. And so he used all this really cool, innovative stuff back in the day to talk about sustainable energy and how can we um, co-locate uh, ener energy generating technologies on structures, bridges, and things like that. So my very first science thing was to go up and measure the wind speed around bridges with, with Mel. Um, and then this picture over here is an, another one of my early mentors, who's a historian of American wilderness named Rod Nash, um, had a great influence on me when I was first deciding what I was going to do with my career. He speaks a lot about techno fixes and how our society seems to really, you know, always want to run to a technological answer when in reality most of those challenges are more complex and need more um, uh, decisions. We need to get in more of agreement, stakeholder engagement, stuff like that. So I'm going to talk about technology, but and I think it can help out a lot for the things we're working on. But in and of itself, it's not it's not the end all be all of everything. And then another note, since I'm going to talk a lot about uh, technology here and not too much ecology or whatever, that, that sort of hurts me to do that. So I just want to emphasize that I think natural history is the foundation of all the stuff we're doing here. And, and I, to me that's the foundational uh, approach that we should be taking when we, we do all these, these great um, projects that we engage in. And so, um, so that's the foundation of it. I'm not going to talk about much natural history today, but, but I, am a, I consider myself a natural historian, so just for clarity. Um, 
to get us going today, we all know this, there's all kinds of challenges that we have right now here on campus, here in our state, here in our nation, etc. So there's an expanding amount of things like intolerance. People want to be isolated from one another. There's this movement to be revisionist in terms of facts and things like that, nationalism, all, the, all this and that. We see declining uh, communities in many parts of our country and world, um, dec declining ecological integrity, technological literacy is going down by and large, and for something that we uh, maybe know more intimately, resources, resources to teach you guys, resources to conduct research. And I would suggest that this sort of emerging fourth, fourth industrial revolution can help us, can't solve these things, but can help us with many of these challenges that, that we have. Um, so let's start with, so this is not my current phone, this is my uh, phone a, a little bit ago, but this is um, uh, the key, uh, one of the keys for unlocking a lot of the tools that, that we use in our lab and that you guys probably use a lot in your labs. And I would suggest to you that we're really in this magic time. It doesn't seem like it, but it's really, really um, amazing. So amongst other things, the, micro, the, the speed with which this technology is advancing is crazy. So this is um, the cost per transistor cycle, and it's having just about every year. And not only is the speed, uh, is the cost, but also the speed is also increasing um, at tremendous rates. In addition, primarily driven by the cell phone and mobile, mobile computing uh, worlds, where we want to be out walking and working all day and not charging our phone up. There's been tremendous advances in the last decade or so in incredibly low power drain sensors and, and very cheap sensors and things that were, are highly accurate. So when you're playing your driving game on your phone, turns out those sensors can really be useful to us as well in a whole variety of contexts. So all kinds of speed improvements, cheapness, and all kinds of, of innovation in terms of the actual sensing of the environment are possible. In our lab uh, at, at, uh, at Channel Islands, we do a lot of manufacturing ourselves, and this has really helped us. So as Crow was saying, we're a brand new university. We don't, I just saw your guys' awesome mach machine shop. I'm super jealous. When I was with Don at Santa Barbara, I used to go into our machine shop all the time. Um, I was telling Crow the story. And then when I went to UCLA, it was a union shop, and I couldn't go in, and I couldn't build stuff, and I was like tweaking out. Um, and, uh, and then up at Stanford, we had a wonderful thing, which sounds like you guys have some of this here too, which is students can, from any discipline, can pay to get uh, um, uh, safety trained and then can get access to, to equipment and build stuff. So we've essentially turned my lab into uh, a machine, sh a part of it, a machine shop. Um, and what has allowed that manufacturing and to build some of these, these cool devices or tweak existing devices has been this, uh, a huge array of 3D printers because we work in the coastal zone, we mostly print in plastic, but we could print in chocolate, we can print in wood, we could print in metal. There's new stuff coming out all the time, new biodegradable materials for making disposable drones that could fly into a sensitive habitat and then, in theory, degrade, except for the computer stuff, they don't tell you that, but, but um, all kinds of neat stuff. Um, new materials daily. Then the other, another key thing for us is the open source movement. So we use, we use commercial products, we use commercial code, and and all that, and those are wonderful products, but as much as we can, we try to use open source stuff that's cheaper, but also we find it's more robust, and the, the revision cycle is much faster than most of the um, proprietary stuff. So open source both for, for the coding and the controlling of these systems, um, but increasingly these platforms are made to work with those things as opposed to having to hack it at the back end, um, and so they work really well. And then a really important one we've discovered is this share, these sharing communities. So when we work on one of our ROVs or what have you, we put it up online and other folks take that and improve our thing and then we take that. And so we've had a tremendous um, interactions with Plymouth Marine Lab in the UK and other places around the world because they, we found each other through these, these online um, communities of, of developers. And you might call this the maker movement or the maker space movement. And that's, that's um, essentially what we're talking about. So in my title, I said the fourth industrial revolution. What the heck is that? I don't know. Um, but uh, it's, it's what some people are, are the taxonomy of innovation um, has been a, an interesting area of scholarly endeavor in the last couple of years. And so, so folks are now frequently talking about these different um, eras of, or different individual industrial revolutions. The first one was mechanization, and that was really primarily water powered and steam powered. The next one was the assembly line, Henry Ford, all that kind of jazz. 
um, primarily uh, driven by uh, cheap and affordable electricity and cheap human labor. The third wave, which is, so we're right now somewhere between the third and the fourth. It's unclear how much into the fourth we are, but we're, ju we're just on the cusp regardless. So the third is all this automation. So information technology, all of our computers, all that digital revolution. The fourth revolution is um, the combining of a bunch of stuff. So the combining of biological, physical, control systems, all this and that, and um, in, into really amazing things. So this fourth industrial revolution is different from the previous eras in how primarily how fast things are changing, how quickly new technology pops in and pops out. Um, and and the, the growth rate of new technologies is totally exponential. And you guys that have, that have tried it, working with any of this stuff, you'll find that within a year or so, there's a whole nother, not even just cheaper product, but a whole nother company, whole nother system. And it's really amazing. And this is causing all kinds of what our uh, Silicon Valley friends like to call disruption. All kinds of disruption in all kinds of systems. Everything from the taxi cab industry to um, healthcare, all that. And, and as we go for, forward in the next few decades, this fourth industrial revolution is absolutely going to have massive changes to production, how we build things and make things, how we manage systems, natural systems, I would argue, as well as, as human systems, and also in particular governance, how we, how we choose to regulate ourselves and stuff. Um, these are some of the poster child children of the industrial revolution in terms of technology. So these are all ones that we use in our lab um, and, and my colleagues use. Uh, primarily. So these are ones that we, we work with and we, we mess with um, sort of on a daily basis. Um, our robots typically either swim or fly, but my colleagues downstairs build crawling and, and burrowing robots and things of that nature. Um, and then, uh, oh, I, just, I skipped it. Um, the artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, pretty much everything. We don't really do much with energy storage right now. Well, obviously, we don't do quantum computing right now, but all the rest of that stuff we actually also touch on um, with the other possible exception maybe being nanotechnology. We don't do nanotechnology in my lab, but we do a lot with microplastics. So we look at the impact of nanotechnology um, with some of our projects. Um, and then, I, so we're, I, we're in a magic time, and I would say uh, we, both of us, all of us, are in some magic places. So Cal Poly is an amazing place, and sometimes we forget how amazing these places are. This is my campus, which is, um, just at the, in the toe of the Santa Monica Mountains, so we're about halfway between UCLA and UCSB, halfway between downtown LA and Santa Barbara, and we're on the edge, you can see there, of the Oxnard Plains. So we're on a big, huge uh, agricultural uh, area, and then where the, the vantage of this picture is the, in the Santa Monica Mountains. So we have access to these great mountains, we have a military base nearby, all this great stuff. And, um, and in the case of, of my, um, uh, my campus, uh, in particular, because we're brand new, we've really encouraged a lot of newness. So new thinking, overhauling buildings, overhauling spaces. How can this most be used to help, uh, help research and help students? Pretty much everything we've had to build, even though we had the physical, physical shell of buildings, every, it, uh, our campus was a former mental hospital. Some say it still is. Some say it still is. So it was built, it was the largest thing built by the Works Project Authority. And for those of you guys that are too young, this was a program to get us out of the Great Depression in the 1930s. This is the largest thing built by the Works Project Authority west of the Mississippi that wasn't a dam. So there was 3,000 guys, three years just to make our campus. So most of what you see there, most of what you see here is hand-mixed, hand-poured concrete. It's, a, it's amazing. It was created because um, the, the idea was um, to give people a better, uh, uh, improved condition, improved life when they have mental uh, health problems. Historically, they were warehoused, but because they were trying to have everybody see nature or participate in nature, it's, it's all this alcove within alcove and all these wonderful spaces, and it turns out that's fantastic for a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, another key thing, I'll, several years ago when I was helping start some drone programs in, on some campuses that shall remain unnamed, uh, uh, I, I said this and I said, one of our strengths is that we're diverse. We have a diverse student body. And this very nice gentleman came up to me after my talk and he said, what do you mean? Why is that a strength? And I said, oh, because we have all these crazy, I have students that are, you know, parents are farm workers and dad's a diver and this and that. And, and he didn't see that, didn't, didn't understand what I was talking about. So he was coming from a traditional disciplinary silo. So for him, the most important thing was, was somebody that, that knew how to code or somebody that, that knew this physics you know, discipline or whatever because he was making you know, wings or propellers. And so he wanted the, the best specialist he could, could get. 
That's not us. So we're actually technology agnostic. We view this solely as an opportunity to gather data to improve management. So from that perspective, we want people that think about things in totally bizarre ways and, and innovate, et cetera. So diversity is actually a really, really key the strength of you guys and of us, of the whole CSU. Um, and then my program in particular has a strong focus on interdisciplinary applied stuff. And we are mostly a field, a field department. And we do a lot of service learning, which is what most of these robots come into play um, with. Um, also, our campus has a lot of unique policies that we had to create to allow this to happen. And we have a lot of unique facilities. So this is the former dairy from the mental hospital. When they, they're, they're, it was so old and they put it in, they had to make their own food and everything. So this is abandoned. But back several years ago, I have so many arrows in my back from dealing with the FAA and lawyers and all those risk management people were the bane of my existence. Um, but, but for example, for a little while, we, we were told we couldn't fly outside. So we had to fly inside, which is actually way more dangerous than flying outside. But that's another story. So, so, um, but this is an old barn with all the sides missing. So technically, that's inside. So we used to go practice there where students could experience wind and all the, the other conditions they'd, they'd have to get used to, but it didn't violate the FAA rules. So unique facilities are also really important. Another key thing that, I, again, you guys share this as well, we, we share it across the CSU, is this educational focus. And for us, the educational focus is absolutely key. Because it allows, amongst other things, it allows us to experiment and try stuff out. You don't have to be going for an NSF right out of the gate with this new technology. You can, you can introduce it, see how it works in an educational context, tweak it, and gain some expertise. Again, we do mostly applied stuff, and we're, we're interdisciplinary. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our robotic history and then get into some examples. Um, so, so we've been messing with stuff, uh, initially began with uh, equipment and materials, but it really is this strong interplay with um, our philosophy. Um, and, uh, and this technology is everywhere. One of my students now works for um, Intel and makes drones for the Olympics. Um, and I can show you a million videos, but we probably don't have time for that, uh, about how ubiquitous this technology has become. Our history with these flying robots began about six, seven, maybe seven years ago now. Um, this was a, a gift to us from um, some folks. This was a this is a old, very old tech. This is about 1999 technology. This is a delta wing fixed wing drone. And I said, yeah, we want it. That's great. Two of them were given to us. Um, it was used by the DOD, but not for bombing or anything. It was used to develop telemetry. So basically, it'd fly around. That's all it could do. So I said, yeah, we want that. We're going to get that. Sounds good. And then um, my, our then president said, no way. It declined the gift. And I was like, well, what? And he said, look. People think of drones as technology, they think of blowing stuff up, they think of Afghanistan, they think of you know, spying on people, and we don't want to be associated with that. And so I said, no, 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 that's not us, we don't want to do that. And he said, okay, to his credit, he said, maybe I'm wrong, why don't you create a policy? And like, ugh, I'm like, ugh, like the worst thing in the world for me to make policy. Um, so, uh, but it was, it was true, it was, he, was, he was speaking to a real concern, and we can talk about this afterwards if you guys want, but but people are very, very viscerally concerned about this technology and what it means for their freedom and all kinds of stuff. Long story short, that led us down a year and a half long path of creating the first, um, what we call our unmanned systems board or our drone policy. And so this is just like a human subjects thing when if you guys are doing psychological experiments or whatever. Uh, the difference here is if we're gonna fly a robot for a class or for a research endeavor or whatever, we just have to run it by uh, the the powers that be. And that's made up of faculty, administrators, and outside um, experts. And so I apologize, but this became your policy too. So, <laughs> so after we went through, I was thinking, you know, it was a little podunk university, a little baby university. Oh my God, we can't, every, every 12 year old's buying one of these things, flying them, and we can't. We have to talk to lawyers for a year and a half. Lawyers. Um, and, uh, and so we finally make this thing. And then we all got shut down in the CSU we, for a short bit. And then we were allowed to go back to flying, but we were essentially told everybody that wants to go back to flying has to follow this policy or something you know, exceeding this. And so, um, sorry, but uh, there's your policy. Um, as far as how we got going in this, as I mentioned, teaching and learning really, really key to us. This is one of our first things. This is for actually a fifth grade class. This is a, a really basic um, robot that we build and use to uh, work with um, schools that are, uh, have underrepresented populations and don't do a lot with STEM. And that quickly led to this, our first grant that's, that supports a lot of our education and then in turn spins off into our research. So in this case, this is a unit called an open ROV. So this is a small ROV that we build. 
to use with, uh, for students doing research, but also we work with high school groups as well as middle school groups. And um, it works in a peer-to-peer -peer or near-peer mentoring model. So our students that know nothing, so we have about 30 students in our lab at any one time, mostly from my department, but they come from all across campus. So anybody can come work in our lab. Um, so we have English majors and social majors and all kinds of folks. So some of them do blogging and this and that. And some of them want to do stuff and they don't know anything so about this, this technical stuff. So they watch some videos on what the heck soldering is and what's electricity. And, uh, and after they figure that part out, then they, then they move to the very basic stuff of, of just checking out, the, did the propellers move right? And so they're mentored by an, inter, an intermediately skilled student. And then as they start to get that down and they move to the intermediate, then they then they're start uh, starting to be advised by an advanced student, et cetera. So these students are self, um, are helping themselves, and they're the ones that are primarily creating most of these vehicles and, and, and uh, modification stuff that I'll show you. So we, um, we now actually have uh, uh, an academy on campus that is used for our local, um, it's our county uh, department of education, but anybody can come to it from any of our, our um, uh, schools in, in the county, and we've essentially created a maker space for them. So we were busting at the seams originally. This is a trailer. This is a trailer from Cal State LA, Northridge earthquake happened. Again, ancient history for most of you guys. And it nuked a bunch of buildings. So they, the science department, or the biology department went into trailers. They used those for 20 years and like, okay, done, we got a new building. Who wants these skanky old trailers? And we're like, we want them skanky old trailers. So they gave us their skanky old trailers. So, so that was our lab, it still is our lab, but that was our lab uh, uh, for a while. And then uh, a couple years ago, we finally erected our new science building. And so this is our new, uh, what we call our tech lab. So this is where we do a lot of our manufacturing and a lot of our uh, building and, and adjusting both of drones as well as other technologies like water quality probes, et cetera. Tons of 3D printing bays that are all run and operated by our students, mostly using open source technologies. And then um, we started getting invited to a bunch of things, things like this DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, we weren't building the million dollar robots, but we were invited in because we were recognized as one of these leaders in education with this stuff, so, so we do that kind of stuff. We do a lot of vetting of technology, but we're super poor. So our first VR helmet is the guy up there on the left. That's a welder's helmet, because we couldn't afford like the fancy goggles. So we hacked out the glass and we put in a, a HTC phone. Um, so we do a lot of vetting of technology, um, and we're perpetually learning. So this is one of our field sites in, in the Cook Islands. And it's basically, we have to bring everything, because, because this technology breaks so frequently, we have to be able to repair it on the fly. Um, and I just wanted to show you some examples of some of the applied research that we, we do with this technology, that you guys can do with this technology. It truly is giving us uh, huge insights into things that either took a long time to get, or, or, or costly, or whatever difficult to get, or in some cases were stuff that we actually didn't have any data on. Refugio spill. When the refugio spill happened, we were able to throw some of our units in the water and go look for um, oil subsurface. Um, this is um, this is like so the basic use. All you guys can do this right now. This is essentially video from a what now costs about three hundred dollar a three hundred dollar drone. Um, and so this is uh, my colleague Rachel Carwright. This is in the Maui Channel, and she does behavioral work of humpback whales historically from boats, and they would guesstimate the size of the boat or the whale. Excuse me, as the boat is doing this and all that jazz. So now we can fly directly over and we can very, very accurately me measure mother and calf and get um, a, a state of nutrition and all kinds of great stuff just from that aerial footage. Um, so here the challenge, this was relatively very easy. The challenge there was the Marine Mammal Act permits, the Native Species permits, but the technology is really straightforward. Here's another example from just a couple weeks ago in New Orleans, our class in New Orleans. So this is um, uh, doing tree demography. And so this is uh, taken off in one of our uh, swamp restorations, one of our woodland restorations. And um, we have a hard time estimating the height of these trees because the canopy is very complex. And so the idea is you can throw up one of these drones, go up, put the camera horizontal, and use the altimeter, and you can get a, a, a decent estimate of how tall the tree is. So, oh, look, I did it twice. I liked it so much. Um, so here, here's, for example, some data. So what you're seeing is on the, um, uh, on the x-axis, this is the drone's estimate of height of that particular tree. On the y-axis is um, the average of five different observers, five different experts in their estimate of height. And it turns out the drone does as good as, as the humans. Um, the variance there is mostly driven by the topography of the tree, the, ge the morphology of the tree. And so in some cases, the drone is the best thing to use. In some cases, we do just as good ourselves. You don't necessarily need that. But we do a lot of this with my lab in terms of vetting the value of this. It's not tech for tech's sake. Does it get us something new? 
Um, in the case of this, it doesn't necessarily, but if we do have a 300-year-old tree, it's great to go confirm that with the drone in terms of heights. We also use um, different optics and things underwater, so a lot of uh, fluorescent stuff in, in, in tropical settings. Um, there's tridacna clams in the middle there. Um, and this, is, this was with a grad student from Plymouth Marine Lab. Um, and then we do more traditional things that we would do with scuba diving, for example. In this case, this is looking at the fish abundance inside and outside a marine protected area on Santa Rosa Island. And so in some cases, these, um, these uh, ROVs might be superior to humans. Not always. But in the case of uh, legal documentation, these guys have the video recorded in HD. You have a, a visual record you can submit to the court, etc. So in some cases, they're superior. Um, we have a suite of platforms that we use. We use fixed, so that guy on the left is an underwater guy, obviously. The guy on the right is a commercial quadcopter. That's our work, work for, um, main workhorse in our lab. That's called the DJI Inspire. And then this guy in the middle here is, um, is a fixed wing. So that we built for 1500 bucks. When we, we have an MOU with NOAA, so we help NOAA with stuff and, and they help us. When we, they have a, a fancy one that does essentially the same thing. It's a little bit better, but it roughly does the same thing for about $200,000. So 19, you know, 2000 versus 200000 I much prefer to crash the $2,000 one. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do, and so that's just basic visual stuff. Then the next level, you can start to, this is um, a screen grab. This is a, a screenshot of a program, but this is actually all online. You guys can play with this if you want. This is a, a cliff in Santa Barbara. This is from one flight of a, this is old now, this, this was probably a $300 drone now. Nothing else, no fancy GPS, no whatever. So this is, um, what you're seeing here is the photo stitched together array of the, the still images that we've created. So we take overlapping photos with a control program and throw it into a program we call PIX4D, or we don't call it, it's called PIX4D. They actually hire a lot of our students now because we've gotten so good with this program. And you have, um, you have a virtual space. So if you have, as we do, endangered birds on the beach where if you walk up, you might attract predators or something, you can actually do this, you can do a scan like this and actually count the nests or what have you back in the lab um, and reduce the impact on the critter. We also use this for um, uh, erosion monitoring and all kinds of stuff. We also use LIDAR. So we have a LIDAR that we've built. So our, uh, right in 2013, we had a fire around campus. Oh my God, I'm going so slow. I gotta finish up this talk. Um, um, we had a fire behind campus, burned up, or actually on campus, burned up, burned a watershed. We got some NS emergency money from NSF, rapid money from NSF. We did a really high resolution mapping of a small watershed on the order of very small, like a couple fo footprints of this building, not huge. That was, um, that was about $40,000 and it took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. The flags kept being windy and then it was foggy and then it was rainy. And then we finally flew it, and it took six months to get the data back. Awesome data when we got it, but you know, tens and tens of thousands of dollars in months. Now we can do that with the drone that we have that does this now is $13,000, including the LiDAR. And next year when we build the next version, it'll be like 10,000, and then it'll be, you know, et cetera. So the, the pace is changing tremendously, and this is just an example of what you can get from some of this LiDAR stuff. Um, and then we also use this stuff in rapid deployment. The other great thing about this technology, because it's so portable and cheap, is when we have something like the Thomas fire that just broke out, we can, a couple months ago, we can um, do stuff. And so I'll show you a couple quick examples there. Um, but this is, this is another photo stitch thing. This is, Mona, this is Carpinteria Beach. This is the, this gray thing you see over there to the left as we're turning. Again, this is not photo, this is a computer recreation of the topographic space with the coloring overlaid from the photo. So this is, we have very high resolution in the X, Y, and Z with all this stuff. So this thing right, I should pause it. Oh, that's bad, pausing. Uh, this thing right here, this is the footprint of all that sludge they were dumping on Carpentria Beach. Six of our beaches still have fecal indicator bacteria in levels too high to measure. So, so the impact of this is continuing, and we were originally trying to get the estimate from the county. They wouldn't tell us how much was there, so we just flew it ourselves. Um, and, uh, and this is after, this, for example, this is right behind Ventura City Hall. This is after the Thomas fire. This is a botanical garden. Oh, actually, sorry, this is a different one. This is, um, this is the, the uh, Matilha Dam, which we're trying to take down, um, and, and some of the impact after that. So we can use this also. This is, we showed this to supervisors and some of the emergency responders, so they knew what was going on. And then uh, stuff like this. So this is from that behind Ventura City Hall. We actually discovered some archaeological ruins that had not been seen in 150 years. And so we use our drones to highly accurately map that with this photogrammetric and LIDAR-based stuff. 
And so this wall had been buried. It looks like, how can you not see that wall? It was overgrown with chaparral and scrub for 150 years. So we mapped that so that now we had these rains and it would get reburied with sediment. We can come back in about a month or so once we, we, we've left the rainy season and actually the archaeologists know exactly where all those resources are and they can properly inventory it. So there's, there's benefits all over. Here's another example. This is um, Thomas Fire again. This is oil seeps caught on fire. Huge number of oil seeps. Cannot, could not get an accurate number. So we have a, a grant proposal in the state right now to do this. But um, this is oil seep burning. Um, you can't put that out with water. It's burning down into the ground. You have to have special chemicals. And um, this is what we estimate is all the, all the, or the potentially seeps burning after um, the Thomas fire, a huge number of, of these guys. So we look at that with coupling infrared and visual. And then some of these appear to be burning so deep you might not see a heat signature. So we're also experimenting with a methane sensor that can be carried on some of our heavier lift drones so we can detect that um, air quality signature and we're working with the air, uh, quality pollution, air quality control board. We do a lot of uh, value of this tech. People like me sometimes get up and go, it's like the best thing in the world. They're mostly telling you BS, right? So sometimes it's the best thing in the world, sometimes it's not. So we spend a lot of time measuring how effective this is. Um, the graph's too small for you to see there, but this is an, a draft version, so it's not done yet. But it turns out that actually, um, so we've compared mapping things like structures, like beaches, with traditional surveying, with photogrammetric stuff like I showed you, and then LIDAR. And it turns out the best is actually, it seems to be the best, most cost effective is actually the photogrammetric stuff. So you don't need to get the super high fancy tools necessarily. You can use some of the standard off the shelf stuff. Again, we're also really interested in how this technology is adopted. And so, um, so that means looking not just at our typical STEM disciplines, but, but other disciplines. So this is one of our sites in the Cook Islands. And you got this beautiful, awesome beach. And oh my God, it's great. And what do you hear? Eee, like, who the hell is that? And it was this crazy Kiwi flying that phantom up there. He's flying right on the landing path of the airstrip, which is a couple miles away. And I was like, what are you doing, dude? He's like, I've got this thing. Like, do you know how to fly that? Nope, but it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> and so that's a huge concern with all this incredibly powerful technology, virtual reality, uh, observational technology, are people gonna use it appropriately? So we spend a lot of time surveying the public in terms of their attitudes about technology. And so um, we have a national poll. I can talk to you about all the different uh, nuances if you're interested, but um, this I think is the key, this is a key figure. So, this is, when we ask people, and in this case, this is um, our, our typical coastal survey that we do every fall, where we interview between about 1,000 and 1,500 people face-to-face -face in Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA County, and ask them about different coastal management issues. And this particular data says from 2014, but we basically said, what do you think about small, privately operated uh, drones flying around? What do you think that's, think that's a good thing or a bad thing? And what you see is, if you combine the bad and very bad and the good and very good, it's about two to one people have a negative impression of this technology, right? And if you read, the lit if you read newspapers and that, you, s you tend to get that, right? Yeah, these people, who the hell are these people? Yeah, they're spying on me, right? And, but that's the total wrong conversation. That's not reality. The reality is the people that are neutral and the people that haven't decided yet if this new tech is valuable for them. So if you add those guys together, Right? You're, you're about two-thirds, and we see this every year, about two-thirds of the folks have not made up their mind. That says that even though that, you know, some people are negative on this, there's huge opportunity for us to educate the public and huge opportunity to engage with, with policymakers to make sure that we, when we create restrictions, they don't clamp down too much on the necessary things, search and rescue, research, you know, sensitive species monitoring, stuff like that. So, so again, it's properly understanding what our community thinks about this technology as opposed to just hanging out here in our university and not talking to the general public um, or whatever the stakeholder uh, is at the moment. Okay, then I'll just end with talking a little bit about some of the immersive learning stuff we're doing. This was high tech in the Victorian era, right? This was like, wow, 3D back in the day, right? So sometimes we also think that we were the first ones to invent this and that's usually not the case, or at least have thought about the idea. Um, so we develop, um, the tech too whenever we can um, and and some of this involves perception so this is a project from a couple years ago this is um, I would show some of these videos but but to really see them you have to have your phone on you have to be turning around or, or go with these guys to their, their cool lab and see them but in this case this was an effort to try to educate the general public about ocean acidification and so in this case the idea was 
They start off and they're in a pretty, pretty ocean, and then you say this is what the ocean of the future could be, showing depauperate populations and stuff. And so she has a virtual, um, a he she has a headset on, and she has these two little funky things that act like hands that she can interact with stuff as she walks around essentially the bottom of the ocean. Um, and it turns out that that's a relatively popular thing to do. So in this case, it's another version of the same idea, basically, where we've created, um, or not we, but, but these guys have created a sort of virtual space, and they're able to interact with it um, and do different things. Um, we also try to engage the public as much as possible in, in terms of getting them hands-on the technology when possible. So this is, we just finished our second annual drone data race on our campus. And so next year, you guys can all come. It's awesome. Any, high schoolers can participate. Anybody can participate. And the idea is to try to talk about some of this robotic technology, some of this immersive technology, and show people that it's not necessarily scary, and also show them the value. The other reason we started doing this is so many people call me up. Um, I want to start a business. Oh, you want to start a business? I'm going to make money on drones. Right? Ah, oh, that's cool. What are you, what are you going to do? I'm going to make money on drones. And OK, so what do you do? I got a drone. And so many <laughs> folks have this stuff. And because the barriers were so strong from the FAA for so many years, it was almost impossible to get permission. So they really focused on that, you know, the flying, the technical aspect. Very much so, uh, most folks do not pay attention to the deliverable to you guys or the farmer or whatever, right? The farmer doesn't want a fancy, pretty map. The farmer wants to know where to put the fertilizer, where the water is leaking, or, or whatever the, the case may be. So this is our attempt. So our first year was an oil spill, mock oil spill. This year was a wildfire theme. I swear to God, we invented the theme before the Thomas Fire, although nobody believes me. Um, but again, the idea is to have people come, they can try on, they, they, they can look at the stuff, they can fly stuff around, and then for the people who want to participate, we have a, a one competition, which is to generate an elegant map, a data product, and another is just to go fast and count something, with the idea that you can take an off-the-shelf, one of these off-the-shelf units, go fly around if there's a fire or an earthquake, and get some amount of valuable data for first responders. How many people appear to be hurt? Where does the oil appear to be spilling, et cetera? So that's our, that's our drone data race. Um, and then uh, just a couple of things to finish up here on, um, so we have some time for questions, uh, is, is how we can use this technology to engage other aspects we don't typically think about. So we've been talking, so right now, right on this campus, we're having some issues with some silly people expressing silly ideas. Um, uh, this is an, an effort of our nursing program to try to create empathy in people. So what this is, this is an experience. So she's got an Oculus Rift on, and she's looking. And, and she, this, the screen is for you and I. She actually sees everything in a real three-dimensional space. And so this is for nursing, stu uh, nursing students so they understand when people start to experience dementia. So this is Alfred. He's an, Afri he's an older Afri African-American man who's experiencing a degraded vision. And so the black spot there is he can't see. And then as you're going through this virtual reality experience, um, all of a sudden stuff changes. And at one point, it goes to a field of flowers. And you're like, well, what the hell? All right. And so he's, he's, he's getting confused. To where, and all of a sudden, it cuts back. And then he's having a, a birthday at his house. And his, and his, his um, uh, family's like, happy birthday to you. And then they say, blow out the candles. And you lean forward, and you accidentally knock the cake over. And then you go to the doctor. So all this stuff is to try to give you empathy for what the patient experiences. Or what's, and we can run this in all different scenarios. What people of other skin color experience, people that don't understand our language. Uh, you can mess with the hearing so that you know, you're, not, you're not hearing people. So you can change all these inputs in a virtual environment a lot of times easier than we can here in practice. And, and the current thing that we're working on is embedding actors into this. And so, um, so, so instead of just sort of a, a recorded virtual experience, um, you have someone responding to you in virtual space with sort of a, 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 sort of a, a computer generated char character kind of thing. And so this is, this is proving to be really, really helpful. In addition, not only is, do you have to have this virtual experience with that kind of stuff, we have other things that we're starting to use 360 degree, 360 degree video and other things in a lot of our classes as starter things. So this is another example from our nursing. I think I'm, I'm about done here. I'll, I'll ask for questions. But, but so this is an effort of our nursing program. And now we're adopting what they've done, which is some areas they're very constrained. In, in their case, it's hospitals. So they want to take their students into these hospital spaces and, and t show them what all the, the hospital looks like. But, uh, hospital beds are, are you know, in scarce supply, so they can't always get in. So the idea is they've created a, a virtual 3D space here using 360 degree uh, videos and camera shots so that you can, before your lab, you can go and you can virtually explore all this stuff. Oh, that's where the IV goes, and that's where the this goes, and that's where the that goes. We can do the same thing, right? It could be a safety training thing for you in your, in your, your laboratory-based classes. It could be orienting them to the peer or whatever. And so you can have this 
Very, very easy, and this is like almost free. The cameras that we use, the best cameras, are $299. You don't need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to capture these images. Throw them up on a website, and then folks can, can have a preparatory experience before the dissection, before the, the tour, or what have you, and they're that much more prepared and, and better able to learn and, and familiar with what's going on. Um, we're also, uh, some of the things we're working on now is uh, something I left a slide out of because I was so excited, but, but doing virtual entrances for parks. And then also trying to do, um, and so this example here, this is from, this was on the Santa Monica Pier several years ago. I don't think, anybody see that? So this was a sea level rise viewer. So that, that guy up there on the blue thing, which is typically our binoculars, like, where are the whales? In this case, when you look through, it was an augmented reality uh, program. And it layered on sea level rise over 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So you can look across the beach right in front of you and see what the, what the, the water level will be at some future time. And really, really um, uh, impactful for people. Turns out the tech wasn't quite ready. They had a lot of glitches. But when it worked right, it was really, um, people really took away um, uh, some neat impressions. And that's the same idea here. One of the things we're, we're, we're working on, although we've been having problems getting the permits from the Coastal Commission, but we'd like to do the same thing for the, for the whole coastline where you'd go up and you'd have a free uh, iPhone app and you would point it out at the coast and you would see all the proposed developments that were not funded, right? So again, when we talk about management and communicate, like, hey, people, you want to tell me what to do in your know, constitution, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, people don't understand what pressures our coastal zones are often under. So having something like this, where you go to your favorite fishing spot, surf spot, whatever, scenic drive, whatever, and hold your phone up and go, oh my gosh, there could have been a hotel here, or there could have been a, you know, whatever here. That is, I think, really impactful and a, and a, and a, a huge move forward with this technology that is a lot harder for you and I just to say, oh, there would have been, been a building there. Much more visceral when people see it and experience it in a, in a virtual environment. And so with that, uh, I'm probably almost out of time. So Crow said you guys got to take off in, in a couple minutes. But um, this is an invitation, so I didn't show you much data. We have all kinds of data, but this was more of an invitation to hopefully get you guys to think about some of this technology and also invitations to, to partner. We'd love to collaborate with you guys. We're a small university. We can't do very much. You guys, huge university. You guys have fantastic resources. Um, and we're interested in all kinds of collaborations. So I'll just end with this. This is an uh, installation that our students just did at the Getty. So this is from our marine debris project, but um, they <laughs> Uh, because we wanted something that this was not virtual, so sorry, this is real. Um, but um, we've essentially created some sculpture to engage with folks, and it was like so much they've now installed it um, in the Getty in this in this big exhibit. So that's all made from recycled water bottles. That um, that jellyfish. So stuff like that is really cool, and you guys should be doing that. Just because we're in the biology department doesn't mean anything, right? You have all kinds of fantastic skills. Use that. You don't have to stay in the biological realm. You can use those wonderful skills and knowledge by collaborating with folks across campus or with us or other folks. So that's my, that's my pitch for immersive technology. And uh, I didn't show you guys any virtual stuff, sorry, but if you want to come up later, we can, I can show you some of our YouTube videos where you can actually put on your phone and move around and, and look at stuff. Great, thanks you guys. <laughs>